Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! It's my life, and I want the right to choose. The words of 67-year-old Noel Conway, who will find out tomorrow if his legal challenge to the current ban on assisted dying has been successful. Our social affairs editor, Jackie Long, went to meet Mr Conway, who says his motor neuron disease has left him feeling entombed in his own body. He says his lack of choice over the way his life should end is a denial of his human rights. Jackie's report does include distressing themes and some strong language. I'm quite an active individual, a mountaineer, climber, cyclist. I did all those sorts of things. It was the end of all our hopes. It was traumatic, clearly. I was really looking forward to so many things I wanted to do. There are so many treks in the Alps. So many climbs, so many cycle routes. I'd never be able to do. Ugh. There you go. 67-year-old Noel Conway has different mountains to climb these days. His vista confined most of the time to this one room. Getting up, getting dressed, the most basic of tasks, an exhausting challenge for him and his wife, Carol. Right, and Caleb. Noel from Shropshire was diagnosed with motor neuron disease in November 2014. I just felt stumped. And then within, over the next 24 hours, I just wanted to die. I didn't want to have to wait. It, it felt like how I imagined it might be a person in a condemned cell waiting to be taken off for execution. You know you're going to die shortly. Uh, so you want to get it over with. Over the last three years, Noel has built a different life, a good life, though one which he says has lived more in his head than with his body. Does that feel all right? Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. He's learning Arabic, he's writing a book, and he's been fighting for the right to die. In the early days, he considered travelling to the Dignitas Clinic in Switzerland, an option he no longer feels is a fair one. I object strenuously to having to pay to leave this country, the home of my birth, um, to go and die. It's a bloody outrage. Insult to injury, I would say. Touch Grandad's hand again. <laughs> this is Noel with his young grandson, Oscar, just months after his diagnosis. Over the years, his condition has eaten away at his ability to function. But though he's felt incredibly low at times, right now, he says, he is still happy to be alive. And are you certain that at the moment, you'll know when the moment is right? Um, it, that's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, I thought I'd crossed a number of Rubicons over the last year, not being able to walk at all, uh, not, be, not being able to use my arms or hands very well at all. Um, but they come and go. So I'm not hard and fast on that. Isn't that exactly what opponents to your bill say is critical? That it's impossible to know the future. It is impossible to say you will be dead by, and therefore that's an argument against what you're trying to do. When you reach a certain stage, you know full well when you're in your last months. A cancer patient knows that they've only got a few months to live. They feel the pain acutely. They have gone through horrendous treatment. 
I'm very lucky in the sense that there is no treatment for me. So I don't have to put up with all this chemical shit. Every month, I'm getting weaker and weaker until finally I will face that situation of where I'm, I'm just completely immobile. And for me, that's a horror. Noel believes the current law breaches his right to a private life under the Human Rights Act. His case argues for new legislation, giving people the right to choose the manner and timing of their death. But they must have medically proven capacity and have six months or less to live. You know the arguments that it's the slippery slope, yes. that it puts pressure yes. on people with severe disabilities or chronic illnesses. I don't see why it should. Uh, I don't accept that argument at all. There is a fundamental difference between being terminally ill and being disabled. Noel will wait to hear the outcome of the case at home, too ill to travel to court. Just one tiny travel plan among many he's had to give up. There are things that, that I would like to have done. I wanted to go to Japan, go back to New Zealand, where I used to live as a child. Um, yeah. In your mind, do you still climb? Do you still cycle or...? Um, I sometimes dream about those things, yes. Jackie Long reporting. Well, I'm joined now by the writer and disability activist Mandy Cullerin and by crossbench peer Baroness Molly Meacher, who is also chair of the campaign group Dignity in Dying. Uh, Mandy, what does that film do to you? Um, it just makes me feel both very sad and very angry, really. Um, the portrayal of, of, you know, from everything from the music, the, the negative music and the kind of emotional heartstrings that that's pulling. I mean, you know, obviously it's a terrible illness for Noel to have and nobody is saying that people should suffer. But the problem is when you're talking about a change in legislation that affects the whole population, then we have to take a broader view, I'm afraid. Do you feel threatened by such a change? Absolutely, I do. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, it, things are not black and white, particularly where medicine's concerned. And there are no clear-cut definitions between having a terminal illness, say, and a life-threatening one or a life-limiting one which many of us have, you know, I mean, I was told, my parents were told I was only going to live less than three months. So... Molly Meacher, this is the crux of the matter, isn't it? I mean, how do you reassure somebody like Mandy? I think uh, the crucial thing is this is about people who are dying. They have no more than six months to live and, of course, are mentally capacitous. What they found in countries where they've introduced such a law is that people don't actually use their right to assist a dying until the last weeks, maybe even the last week or days. We're not talking about people having assistance to die six months ahead of their death. Not at all. They might start to think about it, start having the conversation, start filling in the forms. And what has been very interesting, I think, is that the hospice movement, for example, in Oregon, who were very worried about the law, very worried beforehand and fought against it, are now hugely supportive. Why? Because it provides a better death for people and across the country people are able to live well until the end of their lives because they don't have to worry about unbearable suffering and an intolerable death. That's the key, really. Mandy. I'm afraid that's actually not correct. Um, mm -hmm. that, uh, in, in the House, last House of Lords debate, Lord Alton actually quoted Dr Theo Burr, who's actually on the regional review in the Netherlands around assisted suicide. And he pointed out that there's been a 15% increase in assisted to death in, and has started to include not only people with six months left to live, people with mental illness, people with dementia. And he actually has said also, pointed out very importantly, the pressure on physicians. So Mandy is really articulating the fear of drift. Whereas actually, of course, the crucial point here 
is that the Netherlands have always had a euthanasia law. We're not talking about a euthanasia law, we're talking about assisted suicide. And that's what they have in Oregon, California and elsewhere. And in those countries there's been no slippery slope at all, and there has not been any abuse. In fact, people who are dying feel much safer, and they are much safer, of course, because today in Britain, about 2,000 plus doctors do actually help their patients to die. But let's cut to quick compassion. for a moment. I mean, in, in mm. observing, I mean, we're outsiders, we're not doctors, but Indeed we, <laughs> we look at Noel. Yeah. I mean, is he six months from death? I mean, uh, is he at the point at which he would be allowed to choose? I don't think he is yet, because they're not absolutely, they're not certain at all, actually, that he I will die. No, they're not certain, and he is not certain, that he will definitely die within six months. And it has to be two doctors who say this person will die within six months before you begin the process, which takes months and months and months. And we're therefore talking about the last weeks of life when life really, I mean, his life is going to become utterly intolerable. And he will ultimately just be put out. Um, and so he doesn't want that. Mandy, time. what comfort With could respect, you give? Uh, what I mean, comfort like, could you give Noel then? Well, I think I have to challenge that because, you know, to say his life is going to be intolerable is very subjective. Well, he you thinks it's intolerable already. Well, really he doesn't. He doesn't tell well, as he, he, does, he does find it. Uh, I met him. I had tea with him in the House of Lords. I found it intolerable. No, no, but that's your he, judgment. No, of course it that's is. That's not his. Of course and, it is. You know, you've spoken exactly about the lack of certitude even the medical profession has. Who is to say? that he has when, who, how do we actually get to know when people have six months left to live? You know, well, the British Medical Association, again and again, and in their review in 2014, are utterly opposed to assisted well, dying. Well, more, more... They are, they are. They, they, they see it as a slippery slope, no. and also it completely undermines the health service, how doctors are trained. Doctors are trained, doctors take qualifications. Well, you know, they, they train as doctors to first do no harm. I, th I think That's sadly what you've both done in a sense is to illustrate the in immense mm -hmm. difficulty that judges are going to have Absolutely. in deciding this case. Mm -hmm. But thank you both very, very warmly for coming in. Thank you. Krishnan.